Okay, friends, so this is another kind of long one. Um, this is our lecture on power tools. In your book, Illustrated Theater Production Guide, um, this will be covered in chapters nine and 10. And I'm gonna talk through the basics of the different kinds of tools that we use and what they can do. And then we will also probably be doing a site visit with Ken to go over them uh, and demo some of this stuff together over Zoom at our next Zoom meeting. So first let's talk about cordless tools, right? So these are ones that you don't have to plug into something because they're on a battery pack. The key one that we all see the most is a screw gun, which is a cordless drill or driver. Um, there are actually a couple of different uh, tools which fall under this screw gun category. So a battery powered drill in this case is one of those possibilities, but there are also impact drivers, which um, are a little bit more powerful. There are basic screwdrivers as well. Um, so there are some different ones and Ken can show those to you when we look at it. But if you see something that looks like this, you can call it a screw gun and I'll know what you're talking about, okay? When you are looking at a screw gun, and this is a drill driver, right? So it does both um, drilling and screw driving. Um, it has a couple of parts that you wanna understand, right? So one of them is the chuck. That's this part right here. You hold it and it spins around and locks in um, and clamps the bit into the drill, okay? So the bit is the part that's like the little screw driving component. Um, the chuck is what holds it in place. Um, on a cordless drill, that will typically not require a chuck key, so you don't have to tighten it and lock it in place with a tool. You can do it with your hand, okay? Um, but on some higher powered drills, you do have a chuck key that additionally locks that bit into place. Um, there's also the idea of torque, right? That's the rotating power of the motor. That's like how much turning power it has. And there's this dial right here on your screw gun that changes the torque setting. And the reason you may wanna do this, right, is you need a lot of torque. For example, if you're drilling, right, you want a lot of torque speed. If you're trying to put a screw into some fine wood um, or some soft wood or some other situation, which is not um, as hard to do, then using a lower torque setting is gonna give you more precision, okay? So you want to choose the setting correctly for the task at hand. Although for the most part, nothing we're doing is fine woodworking in, the, in, the, in, like in a scene shop. So a higher amount of torque is not gonna hurt you typically. Um, it also will have driver bits, right? So these are the different screw heads. We talked a little bit about those in our last conversation when we talked about different kinds of screwdrivers. These are drill, or these are screw gun driver bits, okay? You'll see a lot of them have this little kind of a, um, like a little catch on the back of it, right? And that is for impact drivers and other chuck less screw guns. Um, so not every screw gun has this chuck that tightens down around the round part of the bit. Um, a lot of them have an alternative which locks onto a bit like this. Um, and so those are kind of two different sides of the coin in terms of how the bit is added um, or attached, affixed to the driver or the drill. Um, you also have different kinds of saws and drill bits that you can put into your screw gun um, or into a corded drill, a more powerful corded drill, if you need more power than a screw gun gives you. So one of them is a hole saw, which is a round uh, bit that is designed to attach to your screw gun, but to cut out a hole, right? That is, you know, more than an inch, more than two inches, right? You use this for things like I need to install a doorknob into a door, right? So you can use a hole saw to drill the hole that the doorknob fitting sits into. 
then you can have other drill bits, right? So a twist drill bit is the standard one that you'll see all the time. And it may have a reduced shank if the diameter of this drill bit is wider than what will fit in the chuck of a, of a standard drill, right? So the catch with a whole chuck system is that the drill bit itself has to fit into this space. And if it will not fit into this space, then you need an alternative option, which is either a reduced shank or what's called a spade bit or a paddle bit where the, the drill itself is this wide spade, right? And it has cutting edges on both sides, but it doesn't need to be a solid piece like the twist to drill bit in order to cut holes through soft to, through softer materials like wood um, especially the woods that we're using um, so you can use a spade or a paddle bit also to drill those larger holes uh, without having to have so much material in the bit so let's talk about now corded tools some of these corded tools come in a cordless version right so there are kits right that you can go buy at home depot where you can put a battery pack on a lot of these corded tools and you'll still get a decent output off of them. But for the most part in a theatrical setting, we're working in a building, we're not out in the middle of a desert. So we are just as happy to use a corded version. Uh, also because those are more powerful tools, right? So they're gonna just work better because they have power electricity coming directly from the wall instead of what can fit in a battery, right? You need a, a, a lot of juice to get some of these going. So the corded tool uh, that is kind of the one you might first run into, right, is your circular saw. So uh, if you don't have bench tools, and so these are kind of like handheld corded tools that we're starting with, right? If you don't have bench tools like a table saw or a miter saw, a circular saw is good in that case. So circular saws are meant for long straight cuts, right? They are not meant for like carving shapes out of things. They're really fast, like one direction blade situation, okay? Like it, it's, it's not gonna go perfectly straight. You do still have to hold it straight. Um, and you can also use a guide to keep it straight. But this is what we would use in a case where we don't have a table saw, but we still need to like cut a piece of plywood down, something like that. A, a, a circular saw is great in that situation. It's not the most precise, but it'll get the job done. You'll also come into a jigsaw a lot, a lot, a lot. You'll have a handle that helps you stabilize it and hold it, right? You'll have the jigsaw blade, and then you'll have this adjustable table, right? So the table rests against the material that you're cutting and it allows you to do things like change the angle of the blade as you cut, right? This is also a smaller, narrower blade. So a jigsaw can do things like cut along curves, cut irregular shapes, and you can use different jigsaw blades depending on what material you're cutting. So you can have a standard blade, right? You can have smaller teeth. Um, you can have larger teeth, right? So smaller teeth generally are for harder materials like metal. Larger teeth are for rougher cuts like wood. Um, when you have a narrow blade, it's gonna break more easily. When you have a, a wider blade, it's gonna last a lot longer, um, but it's not going to, it's gonna chew through the material more. So it's not gonna give you quite as precise uh, finish edge, okay? You also have options with this switch about how much uh, kick it has, right? So the kick is going to allow it to move the blade back and forth as well as up and down. When you have more kick, then it'll cut through the material more quickly, but again, it's less precise. So if you have no kick, you'll be able to get that nice precise um, but slower cut and then more kick will take out more material and go faster for you. A Sawzall, which is a brand name for a reciprocating saw. This you will find in a battery powered version kind of a lot because they're convenient if you need to get into a little tight space. So it is a heavy duty uh, saw. 
It has a blade that just sticks out the front of it and is a reciprocating saw. So that means that blade just goes like this. I am a sawzall. And it's called a sawzall because it will saw anything is the idea, right? We don't typically use the sawzall in construction of things because it is not uh, so much the useful thing in the building materials, making them nice, whatever. It does kind of go wherever it wants and chew things up a lot, but it's great for strike when we're trying to take things apart, getting things disconnected from each other. It's a great tool for that. So we usually use it more in a tearing things apart capacity than an assembling things capacity. Then you'll have a router which has a lot of cool features to it. Um, so a router is kind of like a drill, right? So it has a bit that sticks out in below a table, right? And then this table will allow you to choose the depth and allow you um, to control where the bit will go, okay? So and that all locks together. So you can set the depth of the bit um, and then you grab the two handles on either side and you drive the router around. Uh, we use it in a couple of different ways in the theater. It's great for to use as an edge trimmer. So if I have like a curved flat and I put a thin material um, like a veneer of wood like Luon onto the surface of that curved flat, I can use a router to just trace the shape of that curve in that thin material and get a nice finished edge on it. Uh, without having to cut out that thin material again out of out of another uh, material with like a jigsaw, right? So a router does that, which is really useful. It's also good for things like this roundover bit, uh, which will basically allow you to make custom trim, right? Custom molding for uh, antique house kind of scenery situation, right? And you can use this in conjunction with a router table potentially as well, which holds the router upside down so that you're able to just like push the wood through next to the blade and cut out the profile, right, of the blade, okay, off of the edge of the bit. Um, and both of these examples have a roller bearing, which is just like a round uh, ring of metal that keeps it from going past the bottom edge of the material, right? So that roller bearing will slide along the edge of the material while the router cuts into it in order to give you that precise edge that you're looking for, that finished edge that you're looking for. This one is fun, sanding. Every woodworker's least favorite part, although now we are all very used to wearing a mask. This is where you wear your mask in the shop is when you're doing sanding because it's throwing dust up in the air like crazy. We use it um, as one of our major steps in our finish process. So you have a couple of different sanders available to you uh, when you wanna move up into power sanding instead of hand sanding, which is approved, right? You have a belt sander, which has a rounded end and a flat belt side, right? So the sandpaper comes in this loop um, it has a nice dust collection bag, which is great. So it does suck some of the dust up into itself as it works. And it has different knobs that allow you to tighten, um, lock that sanding belt on. And this is good if you're removing material because it's pretty powerful. It's gonna take a lot of material off. Uh, and it'll work in a straight line, right? Primarily because of that. Um, the other thing that it will do potentially is because it is the sanding belt, you may get some stripes in your sanding as that sandpaper grit goes over the same space in a circle, right? So it's gonna be running like this and that is gonna scrape some stripes potentially into your material. If you're doing like fine woodworking, that's not something you want, but it will, but it will do the best job of taking material off. No problem, right? The other option, which is kind of great to solve that stripes in the material the problem, is what's called a random orbit sander. So a random orbital sander, right? So this has a round pad on it. Uh, it comes as little wheels of sandpaper that stick right onto the sander. And that pad, in addition to spinning in a circle, also, it's like I'm spinning in a circle and I'm randomly orbiting against that direction, right? So it's just kind of like completely randomizing the pattern 
of the sandpaper as it works and that prevents it from having any sort of pattern grinding into the surface of your material as you sand. Um, so it's also similar to like a palm sander, which this is a quarter sheets palm sander, another tool that's really great just for like hitting spots, right? We'll use it a lot of the time when we've cleaned up a flat and we need to, like once you've built a flat, you've assembled it, you patch over screws and staple holes, and then you come in with a sander to get that even surface before you paint, right? So that is the tool you get handed to do that work. Sandpaper itself comes in a couple, a many different grits, right? So 80 grit is rough, big chunks of sand. 220 grit is much, much finer. And when you sand, so, and then steel wool is like very, very, is even finer still, right? So when you're sanding something, and we'll talk about this more when we get to our final project, because we'll be doing it, right? It, you'll start with the heaviest grit, the roughest grit first, this is about removing material. Um, and then you can move into these 220 grits to get a nice even surface, right? Um, and you'll continue sanding. Sometimes you even sand in between layers of finish to get that perfectly even surface on your fine furniture. Okay, so the next kind of tools that we use are pneumatic. So pneumatic tools are driven by air. They're air powered tools. So we in the scene shop at school and in any big venue scene shop, we will have air compressors built into the wall and then there are hoses that allow you to tap into a wall line of pressurized air. Otherwise you would have to have a air compressor, um, which is also something that frequently you'll have access to on site or wherever. And that would be use, usually plugged into the wall and that will generate um, a tank of compressed air to drive this kind of tool. So the one you'll use the most is a staple gun. And this is a tool where compressed air will drive nails, staples, or trim nails into your material, your joints or your wood or whatever. Okay. So it has a certain set of, uh, situations. Each one individually has a different um, specific setup. So there's always though a magazine, which is where you put in the staples. They come in a clip and you slide those into that track. They have a safety, which, uh, prevents you from just firing staples up into the air. It has to be pressed down against the material in order for the gun to fire. And then it has a connection that allows you to a valve that allows you to connect it to an air hose. So in terms of safety, we always load and unload the staple gun when it's not connected to air. So it doesn't have power in it, or at least that is the safer way to do it. And, um, once it is loaded, then you reconnect the air so that there's not compressed air in the gun while you're fiddling around putting staples into it. Right. Uh, you also want to make sure that the safety is functional and that it is working because if you can shoot a, a nail into the air, you can also accidentally shoot it into yourself. You also have to make sure as you're working that you are driving those nails straight up and down, because if you come at the joint at an angle and your fingers are here, then you're in trouble, right? It doesn't care that it's a finger or a piece of wood and you just have to keep an eye on this tool, right? Cause it doesn't stop. So that's why we have to be careful that you're, that you're keeping it vertical and that you're keeping your hands out of harm's way when you're working with it. Staples come in a couple of different styles, right? The ones we use typically have are, are a narrow crown staple. So the crown is the piece of, of wire that goes across the top and then the legs go down. Um, a staple is used, for example, when it attaching a thin piece of plywood called Luon typically to the frame of a flat, right? Which we'll talk about flat construction in a minute on another video. So when you're doing that, right, the staple is going to bury itself into the wood a little bit, a little bit of the way, and also bite into the material below. And you want it to do that, right? You also want to keep in mind that in this case, 
you use gl both glue and staples, and the staples are mostly holding the two materials together until that glue dries. The glue will end up being stronger than your staples. Uh, this is something I talked about last time when we were talking about those ratcheting wrenches. This is an air ratchet. So it's a ratcheting wrench tool, but it's controlled with this little trigger so that it will spin and ratchet and ratchet and ratchet a bolt, tighten a bolt using air. So that's the sound that you'll hear when the mechanics are uh, putting parts of your engine together or taking them apart working on your car. They're using an air ratchet frequently um, to spin those bolts on and off. And it has the same switch there on the top that changes which directions it's going. So when it's in one, one setting, it'll tighten bolts. And when you flip it to the other direction, it'll loosen them for you. So then lastly, we have bench tools. So bench tools are the big tools in the shop, right? So this is chapter 10 in the book. Um, these are those tools that you just, you usually don't have them in your house because you need a lot of space. They take up a lot of space. They're called bench tools because they tend to be attached to the bench or the ground or the floor, big heavy pieces of equipment. Um, but because they are big, they are more powerful, right? They are able to do things that would take us a lot more time with hand tools or even with some of the power tools we've already looked at. And they also are able to be, because they're able to be uh, attached to the floor and they're very stable and heavy, they let you do precise work because of that, right? So they're unlike a jigsaw, which is gonna float all over the place. It's really based on how well you can hold it with your hand while it does this. These tools are really firmly attached. And so you're guiding the material rather than the tool. And that is a benefit in this kind of work. So the first one that you're going to run into is the table saw. It is for ripping wood, um, which means cutting along the grain, right? So there are a couple of different kinds of wood that you'll talk about in the materials. Um, I've talked through all of that in the materials lecture, but the table saw is for cutting things like plywood and stick lumber. And you like have a piece of wood, right? The grain of the wood is the way that it, the direction that the tree grew. And so that is the tendency that the material would like to split apart because the tree grew in that direction. The table saw is for cutting with the grain, right? So I am the saw blade, right? I'm spinning, 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 and we cut with the grain on the saw blade. We do not cut across the grain with the table saw. That's not what it's for, right? It's for cutting long stripes on the, the blade um, in that direction. You can angle the, um, the blade itself. You can also adjust the height of the saw blade. And then it has this feature here, which is called the fence. And you push the material up against the fence uh, to keep it uh, straight as you cut and to keep it stable. And you push it down. And the fence also will typically have, you'll see there's like a fence lockdown lever. You'll also typically have along this guide rail of the fence a nice uh, measuring tape that gives you what measurement you're cutting to. Um, and you'll also want to double check that, of course, with your tape measure before you start cutting your material. What's missing on this saw is a guard. So um, usually you don't want to work on a table saw with a giant blade sticking out into the air. So a guard helps out with that. So here are some more diagrams where we're talking about setting up the blade. You really only want it to be a little bit above, this is the piece of wood that it's working on, right? And then you can get an angled cut, like I was saying, by tilting the whole blade itself relative to the fence. And so that will allow you to cut an angled edge onto a piece of wood. Here's your fence, right? Here's how you look at it, right? You wanna be measuring from the inside edge of the blade um, because all of the material up to that edge will be removed from the, uh, the piece that you're cutting. So you wanna set that measurement between the fence and the saw blade. Here's a guard, right? 
We love our guard. It protects you from getting your fingers all up into the business of the saw blade, which is very, very important. Um, I don't know if we've been able to get a saw stop. They're really freaking cool. That's a saw which has uh, safety features built into it so that if it detects that your finger has touched the blade because of the electro, like the conductive nature of a finger, it will drop the blade out of the way so that you're safe and it doesn't take your hand off, right? Because that's one of the major dangerous situations you'll run into in the shop. That's one of the accidents that'll happen. Um, so you'll also see this guy over here, he's using a push stick to push the material through the saw. And that's something we do as well. So once your material gets too narrow for your hand to safely sit between the blade and the fence as you're working, then you'll use a stick to push that wood to the last little bit of the way and to keep yourself clear of the saw. Okay, the panel saw. So this is like a bench mounted circular saw, right? So it's a circular saw. Um, but it has rails that keep it perfectly vertical. Um, you also have the ability to change the angle of it if you need to. This is great for cross-cutting sheet goods. So sheet goods are materials like Luan, plywood, anything that comes in a big sheet, um, as opposed to stick lumber, right, which comes in little sticks of wood. So sheet goods, um, we cut those on the panel saw. So you can cross cut sheet goods using a panel saw as opposed to a table saw. And it's also better for that because you're holding the material in place and moving the blade. Whereas with the table saw, you have to move the material through. The radial arm saw, right? So this allows you to cross cut, cut against the grain. Um, and it's typically used for stick lumber more than for sheet goods. We don't have one anymore. They're less common now. Usually you'll use a miter saw and a panel saw and you won't need a radial arm saw as often. And so you don't see them as, as frequently in the shop, but it does allow you to do all of those things, right? Um, so it allows you to pivot the saw in order to cut different angles, right? It allows you to uh, set it up in the middle of the bench, right? And that's how it's designed to be set up. The bench is a long like shelf counter. You set your table, you set your radial arm slot in the middle of the bench so that the bench can hold and keep square both ends of a long, like a two by four, a long piece of stick lumber, a two by four, a one by five, whatever, a one by six, any of those long sticks of lumber. It'll hold that even against the bench on both sides and it will hold that material as you cut so it doesn't fall away. Um, you also have different knobs that allow you to adjust it. It has a fence as well, which parallels the wall of the shop typically. Ah, yes. So if you have to make multiple cuts that are the same length and you have this whole top view set up where you have a nice long bench on either side of your saw, you can create a jig, which is a piece of wood that you clamp to your bench and that allows you to just slide that piece of of wood that you're cutting, that stick material that you're cutting up to that block that holds it right at the correct length from the saw. And then you can just cut as many of any, many duplicates of that piece as you need for your project. So what we have is a miter saw. And this is more common than a radial arm saw nowadays. So a miter saw, can make compound cuts, okay? So that means in addition to a cut that is in an at an angle relative to the fence, right? So this one is an example of that. You also are able to tilt the entire blade. So you can make what's called a compound miter cut where you're angled and slanted, okay? Um, yeah. So you're able to use this handle and it lets you lock the saw at various degree markings, which is very helpful. Um, let's see, what else is in this list of tools? You have the bandsaw. So the bandsaw is a long loop 
of saw blade, okay? And you are safe to cut on this machine freehand, right? So, so because it's a very controlled loop, right? It's a blade, it moves in an infinite circle. Um, and you're able to lower the fence down and this and this uh, safety down, right? So that you're not leaving a wide swath of saw open to your hands. Um, and it's very stable. You can just kind of draw your shape um, through the bandsaw. So this is uh, for finer work than you can do with a jigsaw. This is a much more precise tool than a jigsaw because it is big and heavy and stable um, and you have a lot more control. So if you're trying to like make cool squiggly cutouts and stuff like that, the bandsaw is the tool for that. Here's the picture, right? So it has this blade and a big loop that's like the inside the bandsaw shot, right? Um, and then it has these guards, where the table is, how it all works. Um, when you come up against a bandsaw, you do need to make sure you talk to whoever uh, operates the shop about making sure that that saw blade is being managed correctly, right? So you don't necessarily want it to stay tight all the time. So sometimes it'll be um, in one setting and then that you would set it up to work on it and then release it again in between. It just depends on the specific saw and its maintenance status. So then after the bandsaw, we have bench sanders and bench grinders, which are like permanent attached to the ground versions of a sander for, for working with wood materials, a grinder for working with metal materials. These are more powerful than any of those hand versions and they give you more control, right? Because they are uh, in a solid location and you just push your material up against those nice strong um, wheels, right? You can also very easily accidentally sand off your fingertips. So be careful. They are very strong and they don't care that your hand is in the way. And then lastly, uh, the drill press. And this is a great tool. So if you are drilling holes in things, um, especially if you have to drill a lot of holes and it's important that they're in the right spot and yada, da, da, or you're drilling through a thick piece of material, a drill press is a really amazing tool. It's super powerful, right? If you need to drill metal, it is 100% the tool you need. You just have to make sure you have the right blade on it. Um, and it basically has this whole lever system, right? With these this like handle thingy that allows you to crank the drill, which has a ton of torque, way more torque than your screw gun has. Um, it allows you to crank it slowly through the material and it'll create these beautiful even holes that are very precise um, and it's super powerful. So the drill press can save you a lot of time um, and some heartache in terms of drilling things so that you can assemble them to each other, especially when it comes to metal because it does have so much torque and so much more power. Um, so the drill press is very cool and it's a great tool to use in the shop. So those are our power tools. And we'll have Ken show us where those are located in the shop when he gives us a tour. And uh, there will be a Kahoot with these pictures. And then you will see if you can remember what their names are. It'll be a fun time. Thanks, friends. Bye.